Hi, I'm Mimi Chan. Welcome to Culture Chat. Thanks for joining the conversation. Michael Lark is a Harvey and Eisner award-winning comics artist. He is currently illustrating one of my favorite comics, Lazarus, written by Greg Rucka. Michael has also provided pencils for DC Comics, Batman, Terminal City, Gotham Central, and Marvel Comics, The Pulse, and Captain America. Michael discusses his art process and what collaboration is like with his writers. He also shares a bit about his background and his views on the current state of politics. My favor as usual is to please continue to share this podcast with others. It would mean so much if you would also rate it and leave me some feedback. And if you want to be extra help, you can donate to the podcast to help keep it going on my website or on patreon.com. I appreciate the support. For comments or suggestions, email me at mimi at culturechatpodcast.com or reach out on social media at Sifu Mimi Chan. Now on with the show. Well, hello, Michael. Thank you so much for joining me on Culture Chat today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Well, I was so excited to meet you at Rose City and, you know, obviously got a chance to discuss one of my favorite comics on this planet, which is Lazarus. Well, yeah, it was great. It was, (laughs) it's one of mine too. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, I think it's quite up close and personal for you, obviously, but you know, for me as a fan and everything, it's, it's always exciting to meet the creators behind such, such a cool project. And, you know, just the fact that I got a chance to already interview Greg, it makes sense that I have a chance to meet his fabulous collaborator, uh, which is you. (laughs) Well, I'll try to be as fabulous as I can. (laughs) So let's just do a little bit of like origin stuff. You know, I mean, did you always know you wanted to be an artist or how did you kind of get started? (laughs) Um, I've always drawn. Um, It it never even occurred to me uh, that I could make a living drawing. Um, I was actually my my big thing my other my other true love is music and uh in high school my plan was to study music um and i'd actually enrolled at the university of north texas which is a pretty renowned music school uh not too far from where i lived and um was all set to you know go you know in the fall of 1984 and and be a music major uh, but I had one last semester of uh, high school still to finish, and I had, like, in the middle of my day, like, with all the required classes that I had to take, in the middle of my day, there was this one open hour that I had to put something in there, and I was just, just like, oh, well, I'll just take a blow-off class. I'll take an art class, and um, – I think I turned in – it was probably the first or the second assignment that I turned in. The teacher took me aside and said, uh, you do whatever you want for the rest of the semester, and we're going to enter you for a scholarship. Wow. And so that's what I did, and it wasn't a big – I ended up getting the scholarship – um, it wasn't a big one, but it was, you know, it was, it was money, but I had to major in, uh, in art to get the money. And so my plan was to just major in art for the first semester, take the money, and then switch back over to music. And I learned really, really, really fast at North Texas that I had nowhere near what it takes to be um, a professional musician. And, uh, and the art stuff just seemed to go well, and so I stuck with that. Um, but again, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. I still didn't – I didn't understand how you made a living doing art. I don't know why I never really thought about it. I just hadn't. And I studied um, studied design and, and advertising art, which I absolutely loathed with every fiber of my being. Um, and in a lot of ways, a lot of that stuff I still loathe. And um, and I was still playing music. I was just doing it for fun instead and, and – so it wasn't really a huge focus, and I actually ended up switching my major and getting my degree in English. I see. But I had just enough art to where when I graduated college, the only the only saleable skill I had was doing advertising art and design. Um, so that was the day job that I got. Um, about the time that all that was going on, uh, the drummer in my band – was in the manga. I mean, you'll notice I haven't talked about comics at all. I didn't read comics growing up. Ah. 
at all. I mean, I think I had maybe had one or two comic books through my entire childhood. Um, but the drummer that was in my band was in the manga. And so I went to the comic book store with him. And this was, you know, the late 80s, probably. And um, for for those who were, who were around back then, there was a huge <laughs> – there was the huge boom in black and white independent comics in the 1980s, and there were a lot of small press publishers who were willing to take chances on young artists and creators who didn't have much experience. And um, and I got lucky in that, you know. Well, I, I guess I should rewind. I was back. I was at the comic book store and saw all these books, and you know, I. I, I still have no love for um, mainstream comics art of that era. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I didn't care for it at all. I, I'm not really a huge superhero comics fan. Right, right. And um, so going into the store and seeing all these black and white books, I was suddenly like, well, hey, maybe I could do something like that. Mm-hmm. And um, – and this drummer who was in the manga was also making his own comics, little, you know, twenty-five cent, you know, you Xerox them and staple them together comics. And um, I thought, well, if he can do this, I can do this, uh, which was incredibly cocky and incredibly <laughs> naive at the same time. Well, you know? but I mean, you also did, you know, to be fair, get that scholarship for art. So I mean, you know, you did have a lot of people who kind of believed in you, especially that art teacher. Out of curiosity, do what was the what was the project that you drew that propelled your teacher to be like pulling you to the side? Um, I've actually still, I've still got it. Um, it, we had to do, uh, had to take like a, 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 you know, good size black and white, like straight on portrait of somebody and we had to cut it in half and we had to, you know, paste the, the, the photo on a blank sheet of paper and then draw the other half. Ah. Um, and I drew a picture of Brian May from Queen. Ah. And uh, that was that was what got me. You know, that was what started that ball rolling. I see. And you said, uh, you know, you were in a band. What what is your? Um, I guess are you a vocalist? What's your instrument of choice? Um, well, growing up, I played um, I played trumpet in band in high school, and then you know, in my teen years, I started learning how to play guitar. And um, you know, so in college, it was all about you know playing playing guitar in my rock band that that sucked. We were terrible, <laughs> but um, you know that was what I did for fun. And at North Texas in those days, everybody had a band. I see, I see. You know, so- it was it, this was the days of REM. I mean, music was doing the same thing that comics were at the time. There were all these independent you know, record labels that were putting out bands who were not mainstream pop or rock bands. And that was what, you know, every, everybody had a band. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did you guys record like on, on tape? Um, we were never good enough to do that. (laughs) We just, we played gigs at, you know, like, you know, it was college town. Right. Right. Like gigs, little bars. And, you know, occasionally we made, um, we made forays into Dallas, into the big time, into the big city. Um, but we were always, you know, like, you know, the fourth band on the bill opening up for a bunch of other people. You know, we played like, you know, a little 45 minute set and we were done. Right, right. And nobody was there. <laughs> well, I, I love that, though, you know, because that's just like you're kind of doing what you love to do, which is kind of, you know, fast forwarding. I mean, I'm presuming you love what you're doing now because you're so good at it. But also it's it's kind of part of that journey. And it's funny because obviously I, you know, I talked to Greg Rucka and had him on the show. And it's really it's been interesting to kind of get to know you guys because, of course, I know you as a, a fan of your work and I've gotten to meet you and everything. But um, I was I was I was immediately connected with Greg because I was like, oh, my gosh, we both played sax and we both like jazz and we both were band geek you know i was totally a band that's geek funny. as well Greg and so. i've never talked about that really that's, that's really funny we've never discussed it i had no idea that <laughs> so i that. am i see i'm 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 putting you guys I'm, I'm giving you information you don't you don't even know yet but but yeah so i was totally a band geek as well so i could totally like you know relate i did the, the drum major thing and all that bit so but oh it, yeah yeah that was my that was my lifeline we my family moved from pennsylvania to texas um, in 1980, like, oh, 
It seemed to me like it was just like, and, and maybe looking back, it was a little bit longer, but it was right before my freshman year of high school started. Mm-hmm. You know, so I was 14 years old. It was absolutely the worst time to move across right. the country and not have any <laughs> friends. And had it not been for marching band, I don't know what I would have done. All my friends in high school were, were other band geeks. Right. And it's funny, though, because, you know, you do have that because you're so for those that are not into music or have never been in band or anything like that. It is really like consuming because it takes up a lot of time. But at the same time, you have this kind of because even I, who had no actual interest in furthering my music career, was like, well, but, you know, when I go to college, I'll minor in music because it's such a big part of my life. And then, you know, you get to college and the reality hits like you kind of said, well, I realized, okay, I'm not going to go pro music with this. And then I was like, okay, I don't have time to to pull up a minor in music and what for why was I going to do that like it's just kind of like your dream kind of ends there if you're not going to go all the way type of thing well yeah I mean I was a big fish in a small pond in high school and as I said North Texas is a is a pretty renowned music school I mean at least as far as the south goes I think it's you know the southern part of the United States maybe even you know the midwestern part it's the music school um you know, North Texas music majors are, you know, there's a lot of professional musicians who were North Texas music majors. And, you know, I remember being in the marching band and there were these two guys sitting in the stands during a football game with their backs to each other, playing notes on their trumpets. And they would say what the note was. The guy with the back to him would say, okay, that was a B, that was a B, you know? And I was like, these guys are like, you know, they have perfect pitch. I can't do that. (laughs) You know, I could, I could never do that. Um, So I was just, I just realized really, Real fast that I didn't have the chops for that. Right. So then fast forward, you know, you're looking at the, the, what you didn't realize existed, which was the manga and these, you know, black and white indie comics. Cause you know, I feel it's been, it's been really fascinating to kind of get to know you and Greg, because I feel so, this is why I love your work so much because I'm kind of the same way as much as I'll, I'll read a superhero comic. Cause I'm a big comic book fan now. I wasn't always growing up just like you. Um, but I'm much more a fan of like the non-mainstream um i i kind of tend to gravitate to that which is like people are go oh what are you reading and i'll tell them and they'll go oh i've never heard of that right so obviously if you say you're reading superman or batman or wonder woman you know everyone kind of has an idea they know what you're talking about so you were gravitating towards um this this art that you thought was different and you thought i can do that and then you did yeah i just did um i you know i i gotten you know some of the staples of the late 80s and the mid 80s you know which were like Watchmen and mm-hmm. Dark Knight Returns and stuff but I was also reading I was checking out like Love and Rockets yep. um you know a big influence oh wow Guy Davis his work on at, at Caliber Press on Baker Street was a big influence um uh and another huge one at the time was uh Ted McKeever mm-hmm. um he was doing a book called Eddie Current at the time that like to me seeing that book just made me go whoa okay comics don't have to be at all like all this stuff that you see normally Mm -hmm. you know and um you know it was it was somebody doing real art not just like cranking out pages to make a page rate and hit a deadline so that dc could slap a spider or a batman title on you know the next whatever piece of garbage batman comic they're putting out was (laughs) You know, yeah, and so then, how hard was that kind of leap? Because I mean, I consider you a pretty very successful, you know, comic book artist, and you've worked. Of course, you've done the mainstream stuff too. You've done penciling for like DC and everything. But I know, like, your whole life right now has been pretty involved in in Lazarus because it's been it's been like a tooth since 2012. I think you guys have been on this journey together. I don't even remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, but how did you kind of make that jump to kind of get into your first quote unquote, like not mainstream comic, but you know, one that wasn't like, oh, I'm just kind of doing this stuff on my own. Um, I had, uh, I had done, well, I had done these little, you know, for fun comics and then I ended up on my, at my day job and I hated my day job and there was just, you know, that wasn't what I wanted to be doing. And I just said, okay, it's time to, I'm going to, I'm going to draw a comic book. And, um, so I drew the first 
few pages. I started working on it. I mean, it was, it was hard to do, as anybody knows who's trying to do it while working a full-time job. It's it's hard to find the time to do it. And so I did the first little bit of the first issue. Um, the uh, you know the guy who'd been working with me on the little 25-cent comic – um, I had tried to get him to write this with me and would kind of, kind of take our 25 cent comic and make it a real comic. And he, I don't think was willing to put in the time, but he said, Hey, as long as you give me credit as a co-creator, you can write it. And so that's what I did. Um, and I showed it around at some conventions and, um, I actually met Ted McKeever and he said, finish the first issue. Nobody will get you to do it until you they, they know you can actually finish it, finish the first issue, first issue and start showing it around. Somebody will publish it. And that's what I did. Um, I was I was then waiting in line at a convention in Dallas. Uh, for they, they at the time they were handing out the Harvey Awards at this show in Dallas, and um, Neil Gaiman was there, and I was in line to get his autograph. And the line stretched in front of Caliber Press's table, and their publisher Gary Reed was there, and he asked if he could look at my portfolio that I had my work in and Guy Davis was there as well, kind of looking over Gary's shoulder. And Gary was flipping through it and Guy said, Oh, that's, that's pretty good. You should publish it. And Gary said, I'm going to. Wow. And that was that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, from then on, I, I've never really had to hunt too hard for work. There was, there was a little dry period in there um, early on, but for the most part, then it's just, you know, somebody sees what I've done and says, Hey, you know, we'll, We'll have you do this. I, I mean, at first I didn't make any money at it, but um, I eventually got a you know got a gig that I could quit my day job. Right. Wow, that's fascinating. So there it is. Like just standing in line to see Neil Gaiman, you happen to be by the Caliber Press table, and you're like, oh, hello here, and they and they just kind of were really friendly about it and and offered to kind of look at your stuff. Whereas people must have been like lining up to show their stuff because I, I I've talked to a lot of creators and they said that was the route you would go to the conventions and you would you know pretty much pitch or like try to kind of hustle and and show your artwork and it was tough to be seen. So that was pretty well. Cool I've never been I've never been a hustler or a pitcher. <laughs> um, I'm immediately suspicious of people like that. Right. Um, uh, I've never been a horn tutor, my own horn tutor. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it was kind of, I had sent it out to a few other people and a couple other publishers had expressed some interest. One guy, one guy written me a new one. He hated it. And as somebody who was, who was attached to DC at the time, just tore me apart, um, which was pretty demoralizing, but you know, I have no idea what he's doing for a living now and I'm still working in comics. So fuck him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and sometimes you wonder, cause I, I had spoke to, um, Oh my gosh, it's escaping me now. But you know, uh, people have told me in the past that, oh, you know, there's, there's critics that'll tell you, oh, okay, your work's not very good. But then they'll give you, they'll actually take the time to kind of give you notes and say, but here's what you can work on. But if someone is just being cruel and just, you know, dogging your work, like you kind of wonder, like, are they really kind of credible or are they actually, you know, like you wonder what the motivation is behind that. So I feel like, you I've, know. I've learned, I've learned, it took me a long time to learn it. But I've learned that that's all about the person who the words are coming out of their mouth. It's not about me. I had a professor in college who was doing a portfolio review with me. And I mean, he literally, he opened my portfolio, flipped a couple of pages. And he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I'd, I'd like to be an illustrator. And he said, you don't have what it takes to be an illustrator. Well, I'm making a living illustrating comics and he was working as like an associate professor at a school that's not renowned for their art program, um, doing portfolio reviews for 19 year old kids. So, you know, again, I think what he was saying was more about him than it was about me. And again, you know, fuck him. <laughs> I'm, I'm making a living as an illustrator and he's not. I love it. And so do people come up to you though and kind of say, Hey, we look at my portfolio. Like what I'm sure that people have been, um, oh yeah, would be so curious about you know your you know would would value your opinion and I mean how does so how does it work now that you're on the reverse end of it? You know the best the best thing that ever happened to me um, was the first editor I had at Vertigo, Shelley. It was Roberg at the time, Shelley Bond now, 
um, she was absolutely fantastic because she would never tell me things that I was doing wrong. She would always say, ooh, I really like this, and ooh, I really like that. And that naturally pushed me to do more of those things without saying, well, you're doing this wrong. Stop doing that, which would have been I, – I know me at the time, I would have taken that very much to heart. That would have been a tough blow. Um, I was already down enough on my own work. I didn't need somebody else saying something that they didn't like about it. And so Shelly pointing out all the things that she, she thought were positives was – was really good, and that's what I try to do. Um, I try to, I try when I'm looking at somebody's work to say, okay, what's your goal with this? What, what is it you're trying to do with your work? And then try to work with them to say, okay, how can you reach that goal with what you've got here? Instead of saying you're not good enough, because I mean, there are people that show me their stuff that they just. They obviously don't, at least at this moment, have what it takes to be a professional. Um, but that doesn't mean they can't be. That that means okay. What do we got to do to make that happen? And um, you know, this these these other people that I talked to early on, it wasn't. They weren't helping me open doors. They were help. They were trying to close doors for some reason, for whatever reason. I guess because the doors had been closed to them, and they were just like, you know, well, the door's closed to me. I'm going to close it on everybody else too, which is a you know kind of shitty way to go through life. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Um I really want to talk about Lazarus, obviously, (laughs) is it's one of my favorite things. And, uh, I, you know, like I said, I know that this has been quite a long journey. You guys have been at this for, um, several years now, you know, what was, I mean, I've researched, of course, I've talked to Greg and everything, but I'd like to kind of hear your side of the whole like Lazarus origin story and, you know, where, you know, you and Greg kind of developed this, this really what i believe to be just an incredible project I just I this story's really kind of like spoken to me so I'd like to kind of hear your take on like how it all kind of came about um well you know obviously Greg and I had worked together on Gotham Central yes which you know came about because we both knew Ed Brubaker and Greg and Ed were developing Gotham Central and Ed said he wanted me to draw it and uh, and that was how I met Greg. And I have really good working relationships with both of them on that. And you know, obviously, I've I've gone on to work with both of them uh, repeatedly since then. Um, so you know, Greg and I, you know, I went off and did Daredevil with Ed, and and Greg and I had always said, you know, someday we'd like to do something else together. And at first, we were talking about doing Black Magic, and could find a a suitable home for it. Um, We couldn't find, we couldn't, couldn't put all the stuff together that we needed to put together. And then one night we were out at dinner, Greg was coming through town and we actually hadn't seen each other in a while. And we're sitting there at dinner talking and he just threw out, you know, Hey, there's this thing I've been thinking about. And I, I don't think his goal was to get me interested in it. But he just kind of des- he described what ended up being the first scene in Lazarus number one, and I was immediately like, "That's the book I want to do. I want to do that book." And he's like, "Really? You don't want to do Black Magic?" I was like, "No, I want to do that book. I want to do that." And um, for whatever reason, I think at the same time, people had been talking to us about how what good experiences they were having with Image and. So, you know, we took that idea. Greg took that idea. I, should, I shouldn't even really take credit for it. Greg took that idea and went to Image and said, Michael wants to draw it. Here's what we got. And they said, okay. And it was that easy. Right. You know, it was, so that, <laughs> that was really how it came about. I don't think – I mean I don't know what Greg had in his head. I certainly didn't know aside from that opening sequence and some vague ideas – uh, what seemed to me at the time to be vague ideas about you know this world and you know what was going to be happening a little bit in the background that was the only that was all I knew about it I didn't know what was coming and mm-hmm. I actually got the first script from Greg and uh, I don't know if he's told this story but um, he sent me the first script and I hated it I absolutely <laughs> I well the, the that first scene that he described to me the first scene in the book wasn't there. Right. And I said, Greg, what happened to that? And, you know, he was like, well, that's going to come later. I was like, no, no, that has to be the first scene. 
that's the first thing I said. And I told him it was all about the Carlisle family. And I said, I hate these people. Right. I just hate these people. <laughs> well, There's nothing likable likeable. about any of them. <laughs> They're, yeah, it's like, I don't want to spend time with these people. I don't want to draw this. And um, yeah, I mean, I I probably wasn't as uh, critical and strident as I sound right now after I was just got finished saying, well, I point out the things that I like about it. <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's a little different when it's when it's your collaborator. But I, I did say, you know, it's like I, I don't I'm not into this, man. And um, and to his credit, Greg listened to me um, and. uh that was the first of many, Greg, I don't like this. <laughs> um, usually Greg argues about it and he's right. But this time he listened to me and he rewrote the script and, and that was how it started. I love it. Oh, you know, I, it, when we were in Rose City together, you you know, I was saying, oh, I'm going to go watch and go listen to uh, his panel, which wasn't on anything on Lazarus. Of course, it was about Stumptown, obviously, with being in Portland and all. And I said, well, right. can't I ask Lazarus questions? And you said, you need to ask him, why is uh, Michael Lark such a great collaborator? I go, oh, I will. But they didn't take any questions at that. at that um, Because somebody must have tipped him off. I did. <laughs> They just talked the whole time and there was no audience questions. And I was like, well, great. And so, of course, I asked him on my podcast and, you know, this was a big part of it. The fact that you do challenge him and disagree is actually what he thinks, um, you know, one of the reasons that you are a great collaborator. And I think it goes both ways. And so... I feel like, you know, a project, any successful project where everyone just kind of agrees, that's probably, you know... um, very one dimensional, you know? <laughs> so I think it's sure. interesting. I mean, can you imagine the Beatles if John Lennon and <laughs> Paul McCartney had had the exact same worldview? I mean, <laughs> it would have been boring. You had to have, you have to have the dichotomy. You have to have the, the push and pull of, of that. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I can read Greg's mind in some cases, like, you know, I'm, I'm working on the script right now, the current script I've got in front of me. And, um, there's a page that I'm I'm struggling to I'm struggling with the transition between two different pages. And it's not anything that's a big deal, and it's not anything that Greg did wrong, but I I I'm the 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 transition between these two pages is pushing me somewhere that I'm not exactly comfortable being. And the easy thing there's there's an easy solution that would cause that would mean like calling up Greg and saying Greg I hate this I want you to change it, but I can look at that script and I know why he did the page the way he did. Um, I can just read the script and see oh I know what he was trying to do here I see what was going on I'm the one who's going to have to make the adjustment here because there's a very good reason for it to be the way it is. Um, so you know there's there's. There is, yes, I will call Greg and I will say, you know, hey, I don't necessarily agree that this is the way to go, but nine times out of ten, it's, oh, I can see why he did it this way. This is the way I need to, I need to figure out how to make it work, not him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so you know? I, I think it's great, though. I, I love the fact that you guys are like, yeah, we're great collaborators because we are able to argue really well. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't know how well we argue, but it, it, it always feels icky to me when it happens. But we, I think we've gotten better. It's it's like being married. I mean, you know, um, that's there's a Prince lyric where he says, you know, to be this man's wife, you got to be well educated on the subject of fights. And um, you know, he's it's you've got to know how to how to do it right. I guess you know. It, it, it requires a lot of mutual respect. Right, of course, of course. And that obviously you have for each other and, and, and have been working together for so long. I don't think it, uh, the marriage couldn't work this long if it wasn't uh, a good one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, you know, I, I love Greg like a brother and that means we bicker like brothers sometimes too. <laughs> I've read that uh, you basically, you know, you'll get the script for whatever you're going to currently work on, but you don't kind of like to look ahead. Uh, Is that part of your process? Is that still the case? Um, I don't mind looking ahead. I think Greg doesn't necessarily always like me to look ahead. Um, He claims that he likes he's he likes to keep me in the dark about some stuff, and he claims it's because sometimes I will give things away. Um, and I'm sure it's true. The, the, there was a scene recently where 
we had I won't say we had argued. I I didn't understand what was going on with one of the characters. I had a different take on that character than what Greg did. And um and we talked about it and he was like I think what he wanted he wanted me to have that take on the character because he wants the readers to have that take on the character because he wants to fool them later. He wants to pull a switcheroo on them later and um and he wants to keep that as under wraps as he can. And he says as soon as we talked about it and he told me what he had in mind, I gave it away. So and I was like, <laughs> I didn't mean to. I didn't try to do that. And he was like, Yeah, but you can't help it, you know, now you know. So there you are, cannot you know, unknow it. <laughs> yeah, there are there are little things like that that happen sometimes. Right, right, and of course, you know, when I first met you, one of the big things was we were talking about in Lazarus. There's a lot of really cool fight scenes, and that you know, Greg actually sent you videos of him doing the fight sets, and that you model everything. Like for you, your drawing process is like you do like to kind of see everything super visually. Um, can you kind of talk talk to me a little bit more about that process? Well, I'm not one of those people who is well adept at um, drawing from my imagination, drawing realistically from my imagination. My drawing style leans towards realism. It's what I'm most comfortable doing. Um, I can do cartoony stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just not really something that comes supernaturally to me. Um, And so in an effort to... Well, what I find is that it works best if I've got some kind of reference material for that stuff. If I'm going to draw a car, it helps to know what a car looks like. I mean, there, there are times that I look at comics and I see the comic is done fairly realistically, and then there'll be something in the background or maybe one character that I can tell they didn't use any kind of reference or that it didn't come out as realistic. And I'm just like, whoa, that just took me out of the scene. And I don't want that to happen. Um, I've tried to do... And I've tried to go back to not using reference because I started out not using reference, um, but it didn't work as well for me. So what I do is I either photograph myself. Um, I've, I've found I've not had much luck with photographing other people, and it's usually just a pain to coordinate it all. Um, so I usually do I usually do it myself when I can. As I've gotten older, it's become more difficult. My body's changed and my face has changed and gotten kind of a little softer, and I don't get to see shadows and stuff like I used to. So <laughs> I'm, um, I uh, I use a lot of digital reference now. Um, I use. I use Google SketchUp to do most of my backgrounds, which is actually quite a time saver. I used to spend a lot of time scouring the – at first it was the library and then the internet for photos that I could use for reference. And now I I just build models of the sets or the props, and um, I can look at them from any angle with any lighting that I want. It's a lot better. And I do the same thing more and more with figures. Um, I use – I use a, a program called Daz Studio. It's D A Z Studio. It's kind of like I mean, I guess Poser is the one that more people are familiar with, where you can you know pose human figures um, and light them and things like that. That's that's what I use more often, and I can I can model those figures uh, and and make the characters look exactly like I want them to look. And so that's how I do most of that stuff. I'll reference everything and light it, and then. Um, and then draw from that. Wow, it's a, it's such a cool process because uh, you know when I first met you, I, I talked to you about I worked you know of course I was Mulan and so we I worked with the animation teams and you know back then I mean this is like. Um, early 90s or maybe even before yeah early 90s you know that's exactly what it was you know I would do the video reference and so I would basically do all the scenes and then they would use that footage to draw from you know and that's before the motion capture and all of that and and so I've, I've always really been interested in the process because I can't draw anything like I'm you know my smiley faces are are, are, t- are found wanting so <laughs> I always find the the process so fascinating and um Especially how much it's evolved, and yet, you know, like, people who draw, like, I I had Stan Sakai on the show, you know, and so I love, like, hearing about his process and and what he does with his work and how, you know, some people have taken to the digital format and some people still, like, really want to do, like, the hand-drawn, and it's just always really, really interesting to me. 
Yeah, well, I think that I'm unusual in the amount of work I put into it, probably. <laughs> um, and especially with Lazarus, there's just so much work I have to do before I ever put a, you know, pen to paper or stylus to to screen. Um, it's just, you know, there's just so. I mean, that world doesn't exist. And somebody has to figure out what it looks like. Um, but, you know, the example I always use is in issue two when Greg said, you know, forever – the script said, forever is riding a cool, badass motorcycle. And it's like, okay, Greg, you know, that took you all of three seconds to write. Now, <laughs> does it run on gas? Is it electric? You know, what kind of steering system does it have? How new is it? Is it an old motorcycle? Is it like a big street cycle or is it more like a little, you know, crotch rocket? And so it was, you know, there's all this stuff that has to be decided upon before I can ever draw it. And... um and I've also learned that Greg is pretty particular about a lot of that stuff. Yes, um, yes, I, I learned that, that also early on, where <laughs> I, I had a there was a shot of somebody shooting a gun, and I'd drawn the page, it was done, and I get an email going, "That's the wrong gun." <laughs> and so I was like, "Really? Are you kidding me? Like, is anybody even going to know that?" But Greg knows it. And yes, he's yes. particular about that, and so I've learned. I actually. We were just exchanging emails about um, there's some characters. And I was like, I need to know. And one of them ends up shirtless. I was like, I need to know about tattoos and scars. So because I know that it matters to Greg. Yes. And, yes. Um, and is that how the notes kind of just go back and forth? Are you mostly like emailing back and forth? Yeah, if there's something that it's easier to just discuss it in person, we'll call. But a lot, of, I try not to do that too much. It's easy for me to talk on the phone while I'm working. I'm doing it right now. But for a writer, I imagine that's next to impossible. So <laughs> I try not to disturb him from his writing. I'd rather have a script than a phone conversation. Right. Um, and so yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of emails. Usually it starts off with yeah, I've read the script. Everything looks great. Um, I'll, I'm going to get started on it, and then you know, two weeks of questions. You know? <laughs> well, uh, I, I gather that, especially because, you know, Greg and I were talking and I told him, you know, obviously with my Kung Fu background and the sword fights, and he's like, yeah, well, I had to explain the type of sword. And then it just gets very specific because he is very specific on fight style and the weaponry and every, he's very detailed that way. And so, like you said, if he just writes, oh, and now, you know, she pulls out her sword and you're like, whoa, whoa wait, what? I can see how now, you know, like he's got it in his head what he wants. And so, you you know, all the questions to ask. Right. There was, you know, I don't, people hopefully haven't noticed it too much. It hasn't been too obvious, but um, I've had to change forever sword as we've, as we've come back from our hiatus because early on I had found like some kind of futuristic katana and I was like, okay, here we go. And Greg's like, no, I don't like that sword, but it was too late then I'd already drawn it and we published it. And, um, you know, it was just, it was the wrong sword. It was the wrong kind of sword. So now I, I try to be really good about asking. And, <laughs> and a lot of times some of that stuff, I mean, it, it helps to find character um, for anybody who's read like the second issue back that we did. I think it was the second issue. Pretty sure it was um, where there's the big fight scene on the destroyed launch platform. And Risen um, 2, you mean? Or Yeah, I yes, think, I think yes, Risen 2. With um, the other two guys. The Yeah, yeah. Um, the one guy, um, it was really hard to do because he practices a particular form of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, I think it's Brazilian jiu-jitsu, um, that, you know, I had to watch all these videos and look at, like, uh, I found, like, you know, diagrams of the moves and stuff like that so that I could do this realistically. There were, there were things I could have done that would have looked cool, but they would have been wrong. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I probably ended up doing that anyway, because at some point you have to take some artistic license. Of course. Um, but uh, it was actually part of – I mean it was part of who that character was. It was important and it had to be defined. Yeah. No, I think actually, you know, from a, a fight perspective, I've really been enjoying it. And that's why when I asked Greg about it, he goes, oh, no, no, I've gone out to the park and like choreographed it out. And I'm like, no wonder it's so, you know, detail oriented. And, and But it is true. Like there's sometimes like even when I spoke with Stan Sakai, like, oh, you know, you have to have the sword a certain way or it doesn't play on the page. Like you can't. 
it does it visually on the page it won't work because I get really picky as well when I'm watching film or something like oh they're hoarding the sword wrong or oh that wouldn't be accurate <laughs> and, but yeah. you know when you go to do something like the art I, it's obviously you know there's there's a whole new set of challenges and um, especially with a sequential art you get a little more liberty though because you could go okay we went from here to here and you don't have to show the whole you know the whole movement. (laughs) Well, and that's something that's difficult that, you know, Greg and I have had to work on together as well is, which is, you know, that we don't have to show all every movement, you know, we don't have to show everything and that sometimes it's best instead of acting, you know, Greg tends to choreograph his fight scenes as a, as if they're actually taking place on a stage or on on film. And in a comic, sometimes that makes the fights really short. You know, if if you actually pay attention and look at it, by the time you finished reading that five page sequence, it might have taken five seconds in real time, you know, um, and that sometimes it's better to show just like the keyframes, you know, if for those who are who understand animation, you know, you don't have to show all the little in between frames, maybe just the keyframes. And even then, only some of them will get the point across. There's there's a great um book by the Hernandez brothers and I can't remember called whoa Nelly that's about um, female Mexican wrestlers it's a great book and uh, but it, during the wrestling sequences in the book they, it's almost like they're just like they, they dip in for like one shot per round that kind of shows the overall progress of the fight instead of just like showing how each round progresses or how each sequence of moves progresses, you just see like, you know, one moment from this round and one moment from the next round. And and that shows you the overall progression of the fight. And um, I think sometimes that's, that's a, a legitimate and sometimes more effective way to convey a fight scene. It's, it, you know, it doesn't work that often in Lazarus because of the way Greg Reich's. I, I, I don't really do that that often, but um, it's something that I push Greg on occasionally. <laughs> you know, occasionally you push Greg around. <laughs> no, I mean, it really is occasionally. I don't, I don't do that a lot because, yeah. I mean, I don't... Greg has his way of working and I have my way of working. And if Greg were to tell me, I need you to do this scene real cartoony, I'd be like, what the, what, go hire somebody else. I'm not, the, <laughs> I'm not the cartoony guy. So I would never presume to tell Greg, okay, you have to choreograph this scene this way. You have to change your writing style to right, fit me right. and what I think is best. That's, you know, then you start getting into – it's no longer a healthy relationship. In life. <laughs> I, I don't believe it's the writer's job to tell me how to draw a page. Um, you know, I, I, I believe very firmly that the writer is not the artist. Um, those are two separate jobs and, and there's nothing that gets my goat more than reading a script online or something where the writer is describing to the artist exactly how they should be drawing the panel. Um, I'm like, no, you get to write exactly what the character says. You don't get to do everything else. That's not your job. And you're stepping on the writer's ho- the artist's toes. And if that's what you want, then you need to learn how to draw and draw it yourself. <laughs> um, because if you're going to hire an artist to do it, you're hiring them to do that job. Right. That's right. not your job to do. And and it's to me, it's very um, – it's presumptuous and egotistical of the writer to do that. Right, right. And it's kind of fascinating to me that, that you said that you're able to have this conversation while still doing your, like you're working right now, like you're drawing, what are you, what are you working on right now? I'm designing a character right now. Um, there's some new characters in this issue and I'm actually working with my 3D software trying to, uh, trying to model this person's face and kind of it's a it's a little bit like sculpting like i i get like a a kind of a a blank generic face and i'm trying to turn it into a character who will be memorable on the page wow (laughs) Um, and and will convey the personality that i want conveyed um and at the the same time that it's a person i'm trying you know trying not to do like ethnic cliches or um or things like that i mean trying to make this a a a a character that people will say, Oh, okay. That's that guy. Every time they see him, you know? And how long does it take you to do like one issue? Like, cause it seems like it, 
it takes a while. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, one issue to most people is 22 pages. Um, that's a monthly comic. Uh, I, there's no way I can do that in a month. Um, I more like two months for that. Um, two, six weeks to two months. And it also depends on what's in the issue. Um, the issue that I've got in front of me right now so far, all the scenes are um, – the, the talky scenes to me are easier. Um, there's not as much choreography. The camera doesn't have to move around as much. The characters don't have to move around as much. Um, when, when Greg writes talking scenes, usually the characters – excuse me – are fairly stationary. Um, so those are easy to do. Um, I have a feeling that the the script that I've got right now to work with is going to go pretty quick once I get all the stuff designed. Um, there was there were some new locations and new characters that are kind of important to the story that I had to design them. But that also goes. It depends on on stuff. Some stuff I can just you know. I can knock it out real quick. Like I know exactly what I want for a particular location or I can get online and find a picture real fast that I can say, okay, that's, that's what I need to do. The model gets built. Um, and it's done. Uh, this particular character is giving me a little bit of a headache. Uh, I don't know why. Cause the other characters that I've had to, to create for this scene haven't, uh, but this guy is being a pain in the butt. <laughs> I mean, is it the same? Like, you know, you call like writers get writer's block. Is it the same for you as an artist? Like sometimes you kind of just get stuck in a, an, in a place or is it a oh, little yeah. different because you have the script? Oh no, 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 no. Artist block is a horrible thing. Um, I find what happens to me is if I get sidetracked by something, um, for instance, I got the script for this issue, started working on it, and then two things happened. The first was uh, I had already made had plans to go to uh, to go to England for a convention and to be there for ten days as part vacation, part convention. And then when I got back, I had to do the illustrations for the short story that were in the, the last issue that was finished, as well as the cover for this issue, which I always have to do first. And the the cover became a headache, and that sidetracked me, and now I'm having a terrible time getting back into drawing again. Um, and once I get going and get my flow going, it'll go quick. Um, but if I, if something sidetracks me like that, it can take me weeks to get going again. Wow. So what do you do to kind of get out of it? Do you just have to step away or do you just keep working it? What's, what's that process like? Oh, I, there is no, if I knew what the answer to that was, <laughs> I would, I would bottle it. it and sell it to every <laughs> artist I know. Yeah. Um, you know that it's, <sighs> yeah, it, it's just do it is the only thing. And to be it's hard at first because every page, every panel becomes like the be all end all. And it's like, I don't like this panel. I can't turn in this page. Well, that's, that's not going to work. Um, you know, I was talking to Sean Phillips one time years ago. Uh, and I just, I admire the hell out of Sean for his ability to just be so prolific. And, um, I, I just said to him, I was like, so how do you do it? And he's like, I work from, you know, eight to five, Monday through Friday. And I, you know, I, I do nothing but work when I'm working. And I just, you know, and I was like, well, what if you have a bad day? He's like, if I have a bad day, I scan the page and turn it in. And I was like, oh, you know, uh, you, you don't get to have bad days when you're a professional comics artist, especially if you're working for Marvel or DC. You don't get to have bad days. You don't have time to have bad days. And, you know, I, I'm a big baseball fan. And at some point I realized, you know, a baseball player who's in the Hall of Fame failed seven out of every ten times. Um, you know, having a 30 percent success rate in baseball means you're Hall of Fame material. And that's kind of a, a good lesson for life, I think. Um, you know, if I if I draw a page that's got six panels on it, and I like two of those panels, I'm Hall of Fame material. That page is Hall of Fame material. Um, you can't be you can't you can't be precious about it. You can't say, okay, I'm going to make this scene perfect, because it's never going to be perfect. You know, um, another another artist I really like is Duncan Figredo, and I was I was having dinner with 
Duncan and Sean Phillips and Charlie Adler and a couple other people when I was in England. And, you know, Duncan was like, the best part, the best pay, the best part of doing this art is the first time you read the script and start thinking about what the page is going to look like because everything after that is never going to be good enough. Um, it's never going to rise to that vision that you have in your head the first time you read the script and the first time you envision it. It's, it's never going to come out that way. It can't. And so you're, you're, that's a long answer to the question, what do you do when you're in the middle of that? How do you get out of it? The only way I've learned to get out of it is just practice a whole lot of acceptance that there's going to be – you're not going to like it. Right. You know, those first couple pages back are going to be like, you know, picking up a clarinet and playing it for the first time after 10 years of not playing clarinet. And as a, I don't know, you said you were in band. You said Greg played sax. I don't yeah, know I played sax also. So you know how bad it can sound when you're not, you know, with a reed instrument. Oh, yeah. You know, you get that squonk sound. Pretty, pretty you know? much how it would sound right now if I tried to play. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. If I picked up a trumpet, it would sound about the same. But, um, um, yeah, sir, it's just, not you know, you got to... You got to get back in your rhythm. You got to you got to get back into it. Well, I, to quote, I, I, you'll notice I'm doing a lot of quoting of other artists. I I I, feel, I find that most artists I think are better than me at this stuff, um, and I have a lot to learn from all of them. And I was, I was you asked about doing portfolios. I was doing a portfolio review for somebody, and I happened to be sitting right next to. Adam Hughes. Or actually, no, I had done a portfolio review earlier for this person, and then they came up and had Adam Hughes doing it, and I noticed. Um, I noticed that this artist was was making a particular mistake, and I noticed as Adam was flipping through the stuff, he kept going back to these particular pages that had stopped me as well. And, um, and I kind of leaned over to him. I said, you see what's happening there? And he said, yeah. And we asked the artist about this particular thing, and what we both suspected was true, which was that there was a certain point in the drawing where the artist started overthinking. And, uh, and Adam said, yeah, you got to learn to send your brain out on an errand. <laughs> he said, do whatever it takes. Listen to music, yeah. just talk radio, talk on the phone to somebody, do whatever it takes to where you're not thinking about what you're doing. Because as soon as you start thinking, we can tell like the, the, the quality of the drawing plummeted. And that's true of any artist. That's true of me is that as soon as I start thinking too much, I can just kiss that art goodbye um, you know, it's got to get to the point where the only, the only two organs that I'm using are my hand and my eyes. And so, you know, obviously we don't, we don't have an answer for, oh, here's the, the solution for artists, you know, a block or anything like that. But what do you do for fun? What do you like to do to kind of just step away from, uh, drawing or is drawing your fun? <sighs> drawing is fun. Um, you know, my, my studio is actually kind of like right in the middle of my house. Uh, my, I have a, I, my living room and dining room are one big room and the dining room is my office. So I do end up spending a lot of time drawing. Um, I do, I, I spend a lot of time at it. I'll, you know, a lot of times, even if I've knocked off for the day and, you know, I'll watch movies or read or hang out with my girlfriend and I'm not, I'm, I'm kind of a homebody. So I kind of depend on her to get me out doing things. And, <laughs> um, so, you know, but even if I've done those things, I'll still leave the drawing up on the computer or on the drawing board. And like late at night, sometimes as I'm going to the kitchen, I'll walk by them and I'll stop and I'll kind of look at it and, and look at it with fresh eyes, you know, that it, it's, I'm not in my artist brain right then and i'll stop and look at it as kind of my reader brain and, and i'll see things i hadn't seen before that i gotta fix or see ways to approach a problem that i hadn't noticed before um because i set my brain out on an errand and my, my brain wasn't in that mode and i wasn't overthinking it so as far as what i do for fun yeah that's you know there's a lot of music because i'm that's still my other love i, I still play um uh, not as much as I used to, but play, you know, and every now and then I'll get into a real good tear where I'll get calluses on my fingers, but <laughs> that, that rarely happens. And, you know, I, I, I do, I watch a lot of movies. I do a lot of reading. And again, I, my, my, 
fiance ends up saying, hey, let's go do this. And I'll be like, I don't want to leave the house, but then I'll go do it. And that's, what, that's what I end up doing for fun. <laughs> I I'm, a, I'm a grumpy homebody. I, I, I feel you. I'm a very similar. I told her that, I'm trying, that I think that now that I'm older, yes. I can kind of cultivate this like eccentric recluse sort of vibe. <laughs> I'm you know? a recluse artist. But I, that wouldn't have worked when I was younger, but now that I'm, now that I'm an old man, I think I can do it. You're not that old. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm older than you think I am. <laughs> I think you still have some time before you can be the grumpy old recluse, that, you know, and get away with that. But um, yeah, I don't want to full Alex Toth where I scare people, but <laughs> I, I think I can do it. <laughs> I just always feel like maybe there's like a danger, though, into having like your workspace where you live because there's just that urge to always kind of want to go back to it. Do you kind of keep that those boundaries clear? Like I know there's this thing where – you know, they say, okay, this is your workspace. And when you step into it, that's what you do. But then when you step out of it, you know, so you almost want to kind of block that off. But it seems like, it, you know, you have a very nice balance of not, um, you know, having it take over your, you know, your life that you, you, you feel pretty balanced about it. Um, yes and no. It takes over my brain for sure. I, I was telling my fiance yesterday that I can feel, I can feel the flow coming, um, and I know that uh, I, I can see in my brain. It, what happens is I'll read the script, and at first it's just a it's just a script. And then the more I I dig into it, it will kind of come to life in my head, and to where there's like a little movie going in my head. And all I have to do is pick out the the frames that I want to draw, and that's a great feeling when it reaches that. And the characters will start telling me what they're supposed to do, um, to where I don't have to I don't have to make them act. They will, I will just know what they need to do, um, and I can feel that coming along right now. But at the same time, I've never been somebody to pull an all nighter. Or or whatever. I, I put in fairly long hours when it's going well, but I really don't even notice that that I'm doing it at that time. It's just fun. Um, so I try to keep a pretty good balance. I I try to have good boundaries about. I'm not at work right now, so don't don't bug me about work. You know? <laughs> yeah. Even if my brain's kind of thinking about it a little bit, I don't want to be getting emails from people and stuff like that. I'm like, no, it's 10 o'clock at night. I'm not working. Um, that's kind of hard to do when you're self-employed and especially when you're, when you're doing creative stuff and, you know, there's people all over the world. I, you know, I, I'm sure that I've sent emails to Greg when it's like 1030 at night, his time. And I just happen to be thinking about something, but my expectation is that he'll see it when he gets to work the next day. Right. And that's kind of how I handle it too. If I see an email from somebody, you know, like Mondays are my day off. You sent me an email yesterday and I didn't respond to it just because Mondays are my day off. Oh, good. Uh, but I replied first thing this morning when I started working. Right, right. I like that. I like that. I like the boundaries. <laughs> uh, you know, I learned that fairly early on. I mean, it doesn't do me any good to, um, you know, it doesn't do me any good to overwork myself. I, I don't do good work when I do that. And it was also Hollywood that kind of, made me stop doing that. I, I did one project for a TV show and, um, well, it, it was that one. Plus there was another thing at one time too, where I, I realized that people there don't have any boundaries at all. Um, they don't have good work life balance at all. And they expect everybody else to have that same unhealthy work life balance. And I just had to say no. No, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna work your hours. Um, I don't care how much money you're throwing at me. You know, if you if you want somebody who's gonna work those hours, you're gonna have to pay somebody else who wants that money because there's not enough money in the world to make me give up my downtime. You know, um, it was also having a kid. You know, I I I didn't want to be the father that was always working. Even though I'm right here at home and I was sitting right beside him as I was working, uh, he he didn't have my attention. Right, you know? that's not quality time, right? Yeah. Right, and then, you know, that, of course that changes. He got older. You know, I mean, he's 19 now. He doesn't need me to be in his face about anything. <laughs> so you know, it's fine now. But when I was, you know, I, I had to learn how to have that balance when right. I was younger. Younger. Right. Awesome. So you've named, a, you know, of course, a lot of artists that you respect and that, you know, you, 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 um, 
you know, value their opinion and you really enjoy their work. Um, are there like recommendations for people that you feel like if you were to like gift a book or if you were to recommend people to kind of, hey, go look at this other than Lazarus, of course, and, you know, all the other work that you've worked on. But um, are there things that you kind of recommend or that you would gift to people? Um, I'm, I'm going to make a confession that a lot of people don't like to hear, which is I don't read comics anymore. <laughs> um, I, you know, I just said I don't put in long hours and I don't, I mean, I work maybe, you know, I, 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 I work at least an eight hour day. Sometimes I put it in longer. Sometimes, sometimes, you know, it's, it, I try to keep it to at least eight hours. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that eight hours, the last thing I want to be doing is spending time with comics again. <laughs> you know, I think that anybody who's listening to this, you know, whatever your job is, when you go home from your job at the end of the day, I'm sure doing your job some more is the last thing you, you want to <laughs> do. Um, and so I don't really read comics. Plus I, doing them and constantly studying the mechanics of them has taken some of the joy out of reading. Right, it's gonna but ask I that. don't, I don't get lost in a story like I used to. It, it, it more becomes a, it, it's, I'm studying. Um, so I don't have a lot of recommendations for people that I make. Or what about um, what you're currently reading? You know, I read, I read a lot of nonfiction. Okay. Um, I'm currently reading, like, I don't know how many books I've read about Watergate, but I'm currently reading a book about Watergate. <laughs> Gee, I, I'm a why is that? I'm, well, I'm actually a history fan, ah. um, especially especially 20th century history, um, which isn't even that old. Um, and so I'm just fascinated by that. I, I've, God, I've read... I be living in Dallas. I've read a lot of books about the Kennedy assassination just because I like the local history aspects of it. I'm not a conspiracy nut by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I will argue with you vociferously about the fact that there wasn't a conspiracy there, but, uh, but I love the local history about it, and I love reading about about that those parts of it. Although I think I pretty much exhausted every book on that now. Um, <laughs> the, it isn't like a total crackpot conspiracy book, but yeah, the Watergate books are are interesting to me, it, and it it does have a reflection on what's going on now. Um, if nothing else, it kind of disappoints me that um, you don't see as much uh, character in the people who are sharing the same party as the president, uh, as you did then, you right, know, right. Uh, it's a little, yeah, it's, it's, it's frustrating that there's no, you know, uh, no accountability, you know, and, um, what is it? Geraldo yeah. Rivera told Sean Hannity <laughs> that right now he's the difference between Richard Nixon and Donald Trump, because if we had had a Fox news in 1973, uh, you know, we would have had a full term from Nixon probably, you know, and that's, that's, it's disappointing and it's just, yeah, you know, I, I've kind of gotten to the point where I no longer see anything. I, it's like, well, Trump is just Trump. He's just, he's just, you know, he's just going to, whatever can be fucked up, he's going to fuck it up and he's going to fuck it up in the worst way possible. You know, it's like, he's the exact opposite of Midas, but uh, <laughs> it's Republicans in Congress that make me just shake my head. And, yeah, because and, they're supporting it. They're not holding him accountable. That's the thing. It's very frustrating. I was reading, I, but I, I've been reading a lot of history stuff, and I, I went through a period too, right before we went to England, where I was reading and, and watching a lot of English stuff. My my fiance and I call them call them our big dress documentaries that we were watching <laughs> in England, so that I could be as versed as, as well versed as she was in all the history. <laughs> I, I learned, I had, you know, I had, I, I learned a lot about uh, the the line of secession and succession in British history I over see. the years. <laughs> Not to draw it out and bring it back, but there there has been comparisons drawn between the elements of the story in Lazarus to the presidency and our current state. And of course, Greg and I spoke about that as well on, on the podcast that I had with him and how at first, you know, you're like, oh, there's these horrible families with all the, the lack of ethics and, you know even the family first meaning kind of had evolved uh, or devolved or, you know, into, yeah, oh, into what yeah, it was. No, so was kind of crazy. A, uh, double, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, yeah, there's definitely that. I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't necessarily share that what we're doing is, has gotten that much to do with what's going on now, only because Malcolm Carlyle is smart. And Donald Trump is as 
dumb as a box of wet hair. I mean, the the man is just an idiot. I've I've never encountered a human being in my life who is so willfully, gleefully ignorant. Um, I, it just boggles my mind how somebody can be that stupid. Um, and then there's all these people that are just following along that think stupid is great. You know, I, I, I don't get it. Uh, you know, I've actually, I guess it's kind of been going on a lot in our society over the last couple of decades. I mean, the fact that the Kardashians are a thing, it's kind of the same deal. I mean, it, to me, it's, it's less about, you know, to me in Lazarus, these people, I don't know that they necessarily had the goal of taking over governing it just sort of happened that way. Um, but in any event, they were smart about what they were doing. They, these were all smart people. And they got their money by being smart. And um, and that is not what's going on in the United States or in England right now. There are a lot of these where these right-wing fools are trying to take over. I mean, they're just stupid people. And they rely on on the electorate being uneducated. Um, you know, the moment that that the Republican electorate doesn't have Fox News feeding them lies day in and day out and keeping them dumb, things would change. You know, they, th- these, these people wouldn't have a leg to stand on. But propaganda is winning. And I don't think that... I mean, yes, there's an element of propaganda in Lazarus, but I, I don't see that there's that many parallels between what ha- is happening in Lazarus and what is happening in our world today. Um, I mean, maybe the end result could be the same, but I just don't, I don't see the racism and stupidity and sexism uh, in the families that, uh, that we see today that, that, that to me is what's so alarming. <laughs> it is very alarming because it's a pretty, um, pretty dark dystopian you know future that you guys this world that you've created there's these they're incredible characters and like you said there's there's they are really smart and then so there's these elements but it's kind of sad that if we compare the world we're in today there's so much uh more hate and darkness <laughs> and, and oh, no. what we're living through to me is worse <laughs> i mean yes that system in lazarus is extremely classist and we do have a problem in this country with, you know, Citizens United and, and you know, corporations that are just – that they have no relationship whatsoever to human beings and to human and – they, and they are without humanity. Um, they are without empathy. They are without care. Um, it used to be that, you know, the corporate – and part of the reason I think I like – early 20th century history, and I find it fascinating now, is that it used to be if you were the head of a big company, you had an obligation to be part of your community. Um, you That was what was expected of, of the elite, was that they were going to lead their community, and they were going to make sure that their entire community was taken care of. And now it's the exact opposite. It's they have no sense of community whatsoever. They're these multinational corporations that are so detached from day to day life and reality that there's you know that people are treated like dirt. And I, I think that's what that that if there's parallels to our our book, that's what it is. But there's also this level of racism and sexism and and. I don't even know, religious um, intolerance that's not there in Lazarus. That I think it's kind of a credit. It, it, it says something about Greg's, Greg's own humanity that he couldn't even fathom that. Like, you know, <laughs> like he didn't make these people that evil. You know? I, I, it's almost like he couldn't, he couldn't bring himself to make them that bad. Right. You know? um, I don't know if that was the case, but he was definitely more interested in the economic issues than he yes. was in the rest of it. Um, I, you, like, I don't even think that we saw that coming. It, it kind of blindsided us. Yes. For, me, yes. for me to wake up the morning after the election and realize that what that meant was that like out of the people I run into each day, one out of three of them probably is 
okay with blatant racism, you know, is okay with grabbing women by the pussy. Um, you know, there was, there was somebody that I was fairly close friends with that we just never talked politics. And not long before the election, this person, um, said this person, it somehow it slipped out that they had already early voted for Trump. And I was like, what? You're not who I thought you were. Yeah. And I said, you know, I said to them, you know, that's, you're a racist. And they're like, you know me better than that. I'm not a racist. And I said, no, you were, you're a racist because you say that racism is okay. You voted with, with your feet to say racism is okay. This level of hatred, you know, sexual assault is okay. It's okay with you. That makes you a racist. You know, and and I, you know, I, I haven't spoken to that person since. Yeah, yeah, it's been very divisive, that's for sure. Well, I don't even feel like it's divisive. I feel like, you know, I've got to, I got to put my money where my mouth is. Right, right. I'm You're gonna, moral and spend, ethical, ethical. Yeah, um, <laughs> I've gotta spend, I'm not going to spend time with somebody who's a racist. I don't want that person in my life. Um, I don't. I don't want to surround myself with racism I, and, you know, all this crap about oh, we need to reach across the aisle and we need to hear their concerns. No, we don't. I don't need to hear that you don't like black people. You know, if that's your argument, I mean, if that's if that's one of the tent poles of 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 what you've got going on, we don't have anything to talk about. You're not a good person. You know, um, you don't have an argument to make. Um, I, I have no desire to be to be more accepting of people on the right who think that way. Now, if you want to bring a, a principled conservative in to talk to me about why they think that you know economically we should do this or whatever, right, or policy, or how, yeah, you know, if you want to make an argument about why Medicare for all doesn't work, we can make an argument about that. Absolutely. If your argument is that you know, it's okay to grab women by the pussy. We got nothing to talk about you and I, you've, you've got nothing to contribute to American society. You, 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 you know, that's not, that's not a contribution. That's not an argument. That's, that's just ugliness. And, and I don't, I don't have to give you the time of day. Sorry. You're not a good person, you know, and that's just, you know, I, 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 I had this argument with another friend who suggested that me not talking to that person anymore was something that we shouldn't do in America. And I was like, mm, my argument is that in America, we shouldn't vote for people who hate black people. You know, it's, it, that, it's a lot I love it. Tell me how you really feel, Michael Lark. <laughs> oh, I, you know, I'm not going to mince words. I, yeah, you know, that's yeah. just the way it is. If you say, if part of your policy is that people of color who are American citizens should quote unquote go back where they came from, we don't have anything to talk about. You are not contributing anything to American society if that's your if that's your thinking. You know, you can you can go to hell. <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, you know we don't. I, I think that what we need to do as a country at this point is get rid of those people, take them out of positions of power because they are hurting us. And um, and if you share their values and their feelings, and yeah, I don't got anything to talk to you about. You're not a good person. You know, to me, it's not a political argument. It's a moral, ethical. Who are you as a person? Argument. Yeah, and and that I, I agree with you there. That is something that has been a really big um, point of contention for me because, you know, we, we discussed when I was in Portland that I'm in Florida. And so, and I know you are in Texas. And so, you know, it's, it's, yep. it's been very difficult because like you said, there's the, there's a political argument, which like you said, I'm happy to address, discuss. But when you talk about like, you know, that moral ethical bound, like what really makes me and defines me as a person and not, you know, being racist, having, you know, gender equality, all of it, like just having respect for other humans is it's that's is it right important. there. Having respect for other humans. Walking walking even five feet in somebody else's shoes. You don't even have to walk the full mile. Just give me five feet and I'm gonna be like, okay. But to just have absolutely no empathy for any other human being on the face of the planet, essentially, but but yourself is is what it boils down to. And you know, I, I just I don't have any patience for it. I have I, I have no 
I, I just I just have no patience for that. It's <laughs> it, it's it's it beyond me. It just it's just. I guess my parents raised me right that I don't. I just won't tolerate that. And and again, you know, I had a, I had a friend back during the Bush years who was a big George W. Bush supporter, and I remember sitting talking with him, going, "Okay, tell me why you support this guy." And he got real defensive, and I was like, "No, no, 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 no. I'm not trying to fight with you. I really want to know because you're mm-hmm. a smart person and we're friends. I want to know why you support them because I don't see it." But I would never sit down with a Trump supporter and say, tell me why you support this person. Mm-hmm. If, I, if I find out you're a Trump supporter, I'm done with you. Um, you know, we I, this weekend you talked about being in a red state. Uh, my fiance likes to go junkin, which is the term we use in Texas, you know, going to flea markets and stuff and ah. finding <laughs> stuff. So that's what we did this weekend. And we were out in East Texas, which is about as conservative as you're going to get. And um, some of the people at this flea market had booths set up selling Trump gear, and one of the, almost all of them had signs that said uh, "Trump 2020, make liberals cry again." Wow! And I was like, "That's not a policy. That's not. That's just mean. You're yeah. just mean. And if 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 your policy is just to be mean, then why should I even why should I even listen to you? You know." Mm-hmm. I think it, it's definitely given us a lot to think about. But, you know, I'm, I'm with you in terms of that moral compass, you know, like we kind of have to get back to that versus, you know, just defending, quote unquote, what one thinks is their side, you know, and really yeah. kind of thinking and like you said, respect for humans and having empathy. And, you know, that's part of why I did the podcast. I really, I, I actually told Greg this. I said, you know, I started this podcast after the election and after I read Lazarus. So in part, both of you, it's it's your fault. Why? <laughs> Why you're talking to me now. I just draw what he tells me to draw. I'm not not taking any credit for that. Well, but you're, you are the collaborative, like, like Greg said, it's not uh, Greg Lucas Lazarus, it's Greg Luck and Michael Lark's Lazarus and you guys, like it, it is, there's a big part of, of um, drawing that empathy and, and making you want to stand up and, and be active. And like you said, not just um, sitting down and allowing things to happen around you that you don't believe in. So, so well, I, I, I absolutely love Lazarus and I cannot wait to see uh, the rest of Forever's journey and what happens happens with her and with that we'll probably have to start wrapping up and let yeah. our listeners know that um the risen three will be out on november 27th i believe so make sure they are signed up for that and if you haven't already gotten into lazarus then uh that is my recommendation for everybody to get on board with that and you can see michael's amazing artwork um of course and in all the other work that he's done as well but um this one is quite special i believe so i i just want to Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so We're much for joining me on Culture Chat. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, likewise, it was really fun. Thanks for having me. That's all for today's episode. Thanks for listening to Culture Chat and hope you enjoyed the conversation. Please subscribe and rate my podcast. Feel free to leave me suggestions or send an email to Mimi at culturechatpodcast.com or follow me on social media at Sifu Mimi Chan on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook.